Hello, good morning, and welcome to the hills above Phoenix Scottsdale area in uh, Arizona. You join me with this, the Hyundai Ioniq 6. I've been so excited to film this car, been looking forward to it for a while. Actually drove all the way out here with Anna's Taycan on a big road trip. Hopefully you saw those videos. And uh, now here we are with this in Phoenix, we made it. Now I have this car for the day to make some videos for you guys. And I thought, well, what better way to start than taking you on a full tour of the pricing, the specs, the tech features, the interior room, the charging speeds, you name it. We got a lot to do. This is a very complicated car. I then wanna make another video, which will launch in just a few days after this one, going over how it drives. And you guys know I'm a driving enthusiast. We're gonna go in depth on the driving dynamics of the Ionic 6, compare it to the Ionic 5, compare it to Tesla Model 3 and Polestar 2, this car's main competitors. And maybe I'll even squeeze in some efficiency testing if there's time, it's the perfect day for it. So we got a lot to do today, but I wanna start by just sort of quantifying this car, going through all the specs, everything like that. So let's go for it. A full tour of the Ionic 6. If you're thinking about buying one, this is definitely the video to watch. <laughs> So before I tell you sort of about the car, I would say in depth, what do you say we start going through some of the tech specs and features? And well, the car starts a starting price in America. Again, this is all gonna be optimized for the US market. Starts at $41,600. And I believe that's before destination. And while that sounds really reasonable, when you look at the cheapest Tesla Model 3 that you can purchase, the LFP standard range, uh, might be labeled standard range plus, not totally sure, but the standard range Model 3, that's about 42,990 from Tesla. That includes destination, I believe. Um, either way, so they're right at basically the same starting price. But what do you get for the base money on the Ionic 6? Well, you get a single motor here in the back, which would be a rear wheel drive, very similar to the Tesla. However, in this case, it would only produce 149 horsepower. You also only get uh, a 57 kilowatt hour battery pack, roughly, uh, 53 kilowatt hour battery pack, excuse me, and I believe that's usable. It's still relatively high voltage. I've never actually tested that battery pack, but it would be the same battery that's in the base Ionic 5 and that's in the base EV6. Now, what's interesting about that base Ionic 6 car is it's not actually going to be on sale for start of production. That car will be arriving in the US in a few months from now, so summer 2023 roughly. And talking to some of the guys at Hyundai, they're like, yeah, you probably won't see that many of them. You can only get it with the base SE trim and it's just not gonna be that popular. So that's really all I wanted to touch on on this video about the base battery. I would say let's kind of pretend that that doesn't exist because we're really gonna be looking at the big battery stuff. So if you go on Hyundai's website, you can configure your dream Ionic 6 and go through the pricing and spec and the exact model you want. The one we're driving here is $56,000, a big spread but not unlike its competition. Well, should we talk about range on the car? Because everyone wants to know pricing and range. So basically from 41,000 to 56,000 and a bit is where this car falls into line, excluding maybe potential future end versions down the road. Those would be the spicy ones. The range on the standard car, again, that's not, you really won't see that many of them, is 240 miles. Pretty good, but uh, you know, it's just like, I, I don't think you're really gonna be able to even buy that if you want to. There's gonna be a handful of them. The, uh, the long range version, which is going to be the big battery rear wheel drive in the base trim is going to be 361 miles. So their long range version, 361 miles, that's very impressive. The downside to that though, is you need to get these pretty ugly aero wheels on the car. And it's only available in the base trim, the SE trim. The SE trim comes with cloth seats. It comes with, I mean, everything you would kind of need in the car, but no digital key, no other stuff like that. They really do decontent the car, base sound system. And so I think that's kind of a shame. It'd be cool to get all the luxury stuff and all the range, but you could always just swap on the arrows, find them on eBay or something. That could be interesting. Up from the SE trim, just like Ionic 5 is SEL and then the limited version all the way at the top. The SEL adds these wheels. So these wheels are standard on SEL and limited. They're really nice wheels. I'm surprised they made them standard on SEL. 
SEL, the mid spec, is what they're expecting to be the volume model. That's going to be 305 miles of EPA rated range in rear wheel drive. And then you're going to go up to all wheel drive in those trims, which would be 270 miles of range. Excluding the small battery, when we're talking just about the 77.4 kilowatt hour pack that's in this car, same drivetrain, that's the Ionic 5, you can get rear wheel drive or all wheel drive in any of the trims. All wheel drive costs 3,500 bucks. And, um, you know, some people like it, some people don't think they need it. I'll talk about the tech specs here in a little bit, but it seems like a pretty worthwhile upgrade. And still, 270 miles of EPA range, put it in eco mode, keep the front axle disconnected. I can't figure out why the Hyundai Kia Genesis cars always get so much less range in the all-wheel drive variants than they do in the, in the rear-wheel drive, considering most of the EPA test cycle should be with the front axle disconnected. It's never made sense to me. I actually need to run two of these side by side to figure out what's going on. My guess is the range is closer than the numbers suggest. But let's get into the technical bits now that you know all the different trim levels. So in typical fashion of this car being a review unit, it is a fully specced limited all wheel drive in digital green. I'm loving the color, loving the spec, and it has everything you can get in the US. And so let's talk about the technical aspects because that's what I really enjoy. And then I wanna go inside and see about the room, the route planning, some other things, because this car does now have route planning and battery preconditioning and good stuff going on here. So in terms of the tech specs, we have, again, a 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack built on the eGMP platform the electric global modular electric uh, platform. Uh, I threw an electric in there twice, but you get the idea. The um, battery pack rocks. It is not the largest energy content that you can find in any vehicle. Tesla Model 3 big battery is gonna be in the 80 kilowatt hour range. Polestar 2 is gonna be somewhere around here, maybe even slightly more. But what this car has going for it is massive charging speeds. And you know, I actually haven't even found the charge port on this thing yet. So let me just drop my little booklet that I had to help me get through the pricing portion of this away. Let's go find the charging port. Typically on Ionic 5, it's on the back right. And here it is as well. They use basically the GV60 similar style here, a little bit different actuation. And wow, the CCS port is way the heck in here. Look at how inset that is. So that's gonna be interesting with different style handles, specifically with the, um, like the uh, Phoenix Contact with the big handle on it. I don't know, are they even gonna fit in there? That's gonna be interesting. I've never seen this before. You also have some of your, your charging hold functions and four little pixels to indicate your charge level. Are there any lights in there? There are, there is a little light up there. That's great to see. So let's close that back up. Very interesting charge port. Did not expect that at all. So the cool thing about this is when charging, it has a 48 amp onboard charger, so it'll do 11-ish kilowatts at home, and uh, that's not unusual for the car. But what is unusual about this compared to its competition really is the charging time. 10 to 80 and 18 minutes, 10 to 80%. And that's achievable and repeatable, and I've done it many times and we've gone in depth. Now it's still a battery pack that's sensitive to temperature. In the winter months, you really do need to precondition it on the way to a battery or to a fast charger, which is not unusual. Every battery needs preconditioning in the winter time, but it also can get too hot during charging and slow you down. So you really do need to optimize the car to get the fastest charging possible, but really just plug it in and it's gonna smoke pretty much everything. While its peak charging rate of around 240 kilowatts, we've seen you know, 241, 242 delivered to the car from the charger on Ionic 5, isn't as high as Tesla's long range at 250 plus kilowatts. I've seen 258, 259 on my own Model 3. Just recently, they seem to be opening them up a little bit. It uh, can charge and hold that peak power so much deeper into the battery pack. Two things matter with charging. Charging peak speeds, yes, but more importantly, the curve. It's all about the curve. And Ionic 6 has the charging curve that will make this a road tripping machine. Now, in terms of efficiency, you know, that's always a play into charging as well. The Ionic 5 has had, there goes an Ionic 6 right over there. The Ionic 5 was not as efficient as we were expecting. We were actually hoping for a little bit more efficiency out of the Ionic 5, especially coming from the original Ionic and the Kona Electric 
being very, very efficient EVs, the Ionic 5 was unfortunately not. Uh, it's not that it was crazy inefficient, it just didn't have the magic sauce that Hyundai put into their other products. And I don't know about this car yet. I will say one of the big talking points, talking to some of the engineers, is efficiency. That is a play here, and I'm really looking forward to experiencing that. So we'll have to see um, you know, how well this thing does, especially cruising on the highway to really maximize a relatively small battery pack at 77.4 kilowatt hour usable. It's not the biggest, charges really well. 360 miles of range is no joke in the EPA cycle. Let's say you can get an easy 300 on the highway. Now we're talking, that's a serious road tripper right there. So I'm very much looking forward to trying this out as the time comes. Um, in terms of motors, there's dual permanent magnet motors in the all-wheel drive one, single permanent magnet in the rear-wheel drive one. Now, that isn't great for efficiency on the highway, so what Hyundai does with the eGMP cars is they actually physically disconnect the front axle so you don't have flux-related losses and also some other parasitic losses from keeping the front motor hooked up all the time. And they have a few different strategies for a disconnect and reconnect strategy. Um, but basically in eco mode, no matter what, even if you go wide open throttle, it's rear wheel drive only in the all wheel drive trim. In the normal key up setting, which would be just your general driving profile, it is rear wheel drive 99% of the time, unless you nail the throttle and then it will reconnect the front motor. There's a few different regen settings as well, uh, all the way to a one pedal mode called I pedal. I pedal because the car is gonna switch from regen to output so frequently. Uh, actually keeps the front motor locked up all the time. So if you have one of these and you're going for maximum efficiency, don't use iPedal. And I think that's pretty much what you guys need to know. I mean, it's got 320 horsepower in the all-wheel drive trim. I can't really talk about how it drives or how it performs or how it accelerates yet. You'll have to wait for a video coming up on that soon. Let's talk design on the outside and then the inside. But also, I'm kind of curious just to see what the trunk looks like. So let's hit the little pixel button right here power trunk, I believe standard. That is a fairly large opening, bigger than I was expecting. Wow. Let's take a look in here. So we have a big opening case, a tire mobility kit, very wide, way wider than I was actually thinking it would be. Under floor storage, we have a front plate. We have your 12 volt situation, which is just a 120, not 12 volt, excuse me, 120 volt outlet NEMA 515 right here. Does not seem to have a 240 volt option. So that is just an emergency use charger right there. And I believe Hyundai has something called Hyundai Home that they're trying to help EV drivers figure out what charger to select and all that stuff. For level two charging, if you're thinking about buying one of these and you don't have a uh, electric vehicle supply equipment or a charger at your house, I recommend looking at my friend Tom's YouTube channel called State of Charge. He, uh, he ranks chargers, tests them, and he can help recommend a very good unit for you. So um, that's the trunk space. Design. Wow. Well, I actually think, and I've really, you know, had a lot of contradicting thoughts internally about this. I actually think that this angle of the car looks really good, especially on these wheels. I think the car looks terrible on the aero wheels, no matter which way you put it. It's kind of cool because it's like a moon disc efficiency, but man, you got to get these big wheels and give up the range. That's just my impression. The thing is, if you don't own an electric car, range sounds like the biggest concern ever. But for most EV drivers, not all, there are certainly a few range guys out there. It's just like range anxiety is not a thing. It's all charging anxiety. <laughs> and we're going to get into that in the car a little bit. So this angle right here makes this thing look awesome in my opinion. But then it only gets worse as we go to the back. Coming back here, you get this very, I don't know, sad slope, if you will. And they really tried to go for this one bow design like the Mercedes language in the EQS. It's got a little bit of that in there. But back here, what the heck is going on? I don't know, nothing good in my opinion. You know, glancing at the car at night, fully blacked out, if this was all black down here, it's really not that bad. But we have very long horizontal lines with these vertical slats and it just looks so convoluted and confusing and I don't know, to me, this just does not look great. Now I'm actually pretty positive on the base cars, at least with the Ionic 5, some of the pixels don't 
are a little bit different arranged. The turn signals are in different places. It's very possible it'll be the same for Ionic 6, but at least here in the fully spec one, whoa. Uh, pixels galore, that's the Hyundai electric thing. You can just see pixels all in here, which is pretty neat in your high mounted brake light, pixels all along the back. I don't know how many pixels are on this thing. I'm sure someone has counted and we'll put that in a review on one of our friends channels or, or written articles. I think it'd be kind of interesting to see. So design for me on the outside is, uh, I don't know, personally, I would never go for this over an Ionic 5. I like the hatchback style. I like the uh, everything with the Ionic 5. What's funny is the seating position feels almost identical to Ionic 5. From the ground to where your butt sits, it's very possible this is lower, but my impression just sitting in here, let me just have a seat, is almost identical to Ionic 5. I sit very high in the car, it almost has an SUV-like feel to me, or a small crossover. I have to put you know, the camera up very high just to see the hood, so I gotta put my head all the way to the roof. And um, before I tell you about seat room and everything, let's talk about interior design, because there's some weird things going on here. The door doesn't have any window switches on it. It's just a non, it's a buttonless door with the largest speaker grill I've ever seen in my life, but the speaker only takes up this much space. By the way, the big sound system, the Bose, only comes in the limited trim, and it's similar to Ionic 5. It's not great, it's not terrible, it's livable. The Meridian in the EV6 GT I just sampled was much better than this. And then you have this area where you can kind of put stuff. And let me tell you exactly how this is gonna go. You're gonna take pens and you're gonna throw them in there. And then when you go around corners, that's what you're gonna hear. It's just straight plastic in there that's gonna make all this noise and stuff's gonna rattle. So I really wish they put some soft touch material in here because people are gonna use it as a junk drawer and it's gonna make so much noise. Same goes actually for all these cup holders. It's very hard, kind of cheap feeling plastic. And it's just, I mean, it just feels a little bit cheap to me. Uh, the window switches have been moved here to the center, which I actually, think is the wrong decision because I would rather have more storage area here and then just have a traditional door set up here. Your mirrors have moved here and um, you know mirror controls have moved there. And I think the reason the mirror controls have moved here is because as a global product, this car does not have wing mirrors on it or door mirrors. They actually use digital mirrors and they achieve a 0.21 coefficient of drag without the mirrors. The mirrors add another 0.1 coefficient of drag. And of course that doesn't necessarily represent the whole car because it's always coefficient of drag times surface area and it is still a pretty large car. But um, in the US market, it's illegal to have digital mirrors. So we have to have the digital mirrors. What's interesting is you'll hear probably Hyundai market that 0.21 or 0.22 coefficient of drag in our market. That is only available in the base trim. The upgraded trims like this here, SEL or limited with the big wheels, this is almost 0.24 coefficient of drag. The wheels have that much of an impact on the aerodynamics of the car. And uh, you know, I could see myself if we ever got one of these or we were using it, maybe getting an extra set of the aero wheels, slapping them on to do big road trips or range testing. I don't know, it could be kind of interesting, but I thought that was neat. Also more pixels here in the side of the door mirror. Let's take a look in the rear. By the way, as standard, our power um, door handles, which is great. I did leave the car on, which is why the rear isn't opening up. And the key should be maybe in my pocket, I hope. Let's take a look. Maybe I shouldn't have shut off the car if I didn't have the key. I do, here it is. Let's go through the locking and unlocking sequence. Of course, you get Blue Link, the Hyundai app. You can check your state of charge. You can remote start the car. You can set your charging limits, your charging power. It's actually a pretty good app. It's not as user-friendly as Tesla, but it gets the job done. This is the key. This has to be the worst feeling key I've ever touched. It's so light. They just need to put some lead in this thing. Give it some weight. Don't make it plastic, make it metal. But you have these little buttons on the face of it. So lock, unlock, remote start, and your alarm. On the side here, you have, ah, Smart Park, which is Smart Park for those who watch that commercial. I actually don't even, I've never even tried it. Let's do it. Press hold. So now the car is on and I'm gonna push reverse. And there it goes, backwards. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's slowly moving. Smart pack. 
Great commercial for those who hadn't seen it. Okay, well that works and we've com conveniently arrived at the rear door. So now I can shut the car off and lock it. So let's hit unlock. You'll see the door handles pop out. I believe unlike Ionic 5 standard power door handles, which is really great. Here's the window sticker for this particular one. This one is 57425 after destination. It has the $210 carpeted floor mat option. That should be standard, but it's not. And um, here's everything about it. Dark green exterior, interior color is the dark green slash dark green. It's definitely more like gray slash gray, <laughs> not dark green. So the, for those who are curious what the dark green interior color looks like, it's this. It's only available on two exterior colors, and that's where you get this sort of green hued situation. And it must be on this. I can't remember the other paint color. You can still get gray on every exterior color as long as you get SEL or limited with the upgraded leather. So um, interesting. That's the spec on this particular one and everything's Korea, of course. It does not qualify for tax credits. Back to the pricing discussion. Um, the only time this car will qualify for a tax credit in the US is if you lease it, and Hyundai is passing on the full $7,500, I believe is a cap cost reduction on your lease, so these things should lease out pretty well. Let's jump in the back. I have the seating position in the driver's seat set to where I would sit, and that is a lot, a lot of leg room right here, folks. Huge back seats. Also, big upgrade, USB-C ports in a Hyundai, thankfully. However, there is still a USB-A port up there on the dash. What the heck? Makes no sense to me. You have these LED lights up here and pretty good headroom. I mean, the back seat's large. It's not small, but it's not like Model S big. It's, it's still, you know, a small car, but it definitely feels more than Model 3. Let me show you the headroom back here. It's okay. My head, the roof is scalloped a little bit. I wish the seat could sit lower, but I'm actually sitting right on top of the onboard charger for the vehicle. If we take this down, you can see two cup holders, little armrest. It's basic back here, nothing exciting to me, but um, you know, plenty of room, it's okay. Headroom actually could be a little bit better. I can feel my head hitting this. And that's actually the same for the front seat as well. I definitely notice a lot more headroom in the Ionic 5 than I do in the Ionic 6, and that makes sense because this is a smaller sedan. Let's jump in the front seat and let me show you the headroom up here. By the way, big front door, love this very wide opening. This is great, easy to get in and out of. You still, I don't find myself hitting my head on the way in very easily, that's very nice. And then I come to the headroom here. With the glass roof, um, it's not bad. My head is not hitting, I don't feel claustrophobic. However, I do notice that like if I just lift up a little bit, I'm in the roof. So I'm six foot one. I know my dad who's six foot five, he might actually have some issues here. So I encourage you to take a look at yours at your dealer and see if you actually fit in this thing because I can't think of many cars in recent memory that I have this much of a headroom problem with. Also, since Model 3 is this car's direct competitor, I gotta bring it up a lot because that is really the value play there. I made a video recently that the Model 3 LFP is setting the automotive benchmark. And again, on the interior, the base Model 3 for 42 grand comes with a full glass canopy. Here in the Ionic 6, I have to spec up to 50 something thousand dollars just to get this small roof. Now, granted it does open, and I can show you that right here. Let me power on the car and open up the roof. So, there you go. The roof, sorry for the poor camera work, does open. And that's all the way back, so that's all you get. Big cactus out the roof. And the seats are okay. I mean, um, I, I fit in them quite comfortably. They're just quite tall for me. So I really think it would be great if they could drop them another inch or two. It would really help with headroom. One thing we haven't done yet before we get into the technology on the inside, I know I'm just bouncing around, but this is just sort of my first initial impressions. I'm learning the car along with you, is what the heck's going on under the hood? Is there a front trunk? I don't know. Here we go open up yeah check that out there is a front trunk very nice packaging under here because most i'm thinking about volkswagen id7 for example i don't believe will have a front trunk so that's going to be this car's competitor as well doesn't look like we have electronic dampers on this car might be room for it as an option you have your washer fluid some coolant you have your fuse panel right here 12 volt batteries right under here you have your Ionic. I don't know if the rear wheel drive has a bigger front trunk. 
Uh, like I know European spec uh, Ionic 5s do have a bigger front trunk for rear wheel drive because this is on top of the front motor. It's very small, but I'm just glad there's something here. Let's see what happens if I start pulling back on stuff. Open, open. Okay, let's go. Open, there we go, thank you. Wow, you just have your inverter right there. So, I mean, they've packaged every last inch they could out of this thing. And, uh, you know, that's just as you would expect. Now, how the heck do I close the thing I just opened? Pushing. Boom, good as new. Sorry, Hyundai, not sorry. We had to show the viewers what was going on. <laughs> so, let's take a look at this. Love the front view, LED lights as standard. One thing I wanna talk about on the outside of the car is the driver assistance. It's something that really is an integral part of ownership and to me, one of the most important parts of a car like this. For many people, this is gonna be your only vehicle. So it needs to do a lot of things. It needs to haul all your friends around. It needs to be a sports car for the fun out in the hills. It needs to have good driver assistance for the long road trips. You know, at the end of the day, people, who buy electric cars are starting to road trip them. We see them out there. We see a lot of Ionic 5 owners driving cross country, going places, and uh, to do those long highway stretches, you need good driver assistance. So let's take a look at the sensors. We have one camera up here in the windshield. We have a radar under here, but we also have radars in the corner for, in the rear, there's radars as well. So it's got, I don't know how many radars, four, five radars, something like that. It's pretty interesting actually. And so this particular spec has HDA2. And you can, on the base trim, I believe you get HDA1. On SEL, you get HDA2. HDA2 allows for lane changes and a few other things. It's pretty nice. One of my favorite driver assistance systems on the market. It did not score very well in our hogback driver assistance test. And that's mostly because on the sharp corners, it kind of sways a little bit. But if you're just cruising down the highway in traffic, it has scooching. If you're next to a vehicle that's moving over into you, it pushes you to the outside of your lane. It's a really good driver assistance system. So, um, and one of my favorite features of this is you can actually separate the steering control from the adaptive cruise. I'm also just noticing this here. I love this little detail, the plus and minus right here on the uh, pedals. That's pretty fun. That is cool. Well, I think, uh, you know, aside from extra storage and some other things in the car, that's a pretty thorough tour of the physical components. Let's talk about the software. Let's try the route planning. Let's see how that all looks. Well, you join me inside the Ionic 6 right now, and you'll notice these are lit up, and they actually will be a charging indicator and a few other things, I'm told. So the four dots indicate H in Morse code, but now they're actually lit. And I'm trying to think if I've ever seen a lit panel in front of a airbag. That's pretty interesting. I think that's a first. You of course have your different drive modes, eco, normal, sport, and then you can hold for snow mode. Both sport and snow keep the front axle connected all the time. Nothing is unchanged from Ionic 5 here. You have your buttons on the wheel to do all of your cruise control stuff. You can run through all of your driving stuff to see if your front motor is connected or not. Again, I'll do some driver assistance testing here and, um, you know, and some range testing here pretty soon. So that'll be kind of interesting to see. I kind of ripped it up here, but uh, there's actually a base car on the aero wheels. Check that out, just so you can get a little glimpse of them. Um, all of the driver assistance stuff is pretty good in this car. You can see we're in uh, snow mode right now, some other things, but here's what I really want to find out. I want to see if this thing can do route planning. So let's put in to nav, let's search for Fort Collins. Now these are all the places it's been to before. I guess we want to go here to Fort Collins, Colorado. I already tried this out and I'm really curious to see what the car will do because um, it asks, would you like to stop at an EV charging station? And it's like, yeah, no crap. Of course I want to stop at a charging station. Why even, why are you asking me? So already a little bit like, what? Like, <laughs> I can't just make it there on one charge. Of course I need to stop and charge. And that's this is a system that was adapted for, obviously, combustion vehicles, or was made for combustion vehicles adapted to electric. So let's go for the cost-effective route. I would prefer to go this way, avoid some weather up in the mountains, just giving it a go. So let's hit Start Guidance. And let's hit it again. Oh, it's a little bit locked up at the moment. There we go. So now 
it should list all of our chargers. However, only one has loaded in here at the moment. And it is correct, it's a DC fast charging plus at a Walmart. And um, nothing wrong with that, that's great. But what am I supposed to do after it? So when I tried this last time off camera, it actually was routing me to AC chargers. And I thought that was a little bit wild. I've been to this Walmart before in Flagstaff and that's a great stop. That's exactly where I would go as well. It's only 136 miles, but it's a big stretch after that. So um, looks like we'd get there and maybe figure out the next stop afterwards. You would think it would plot out all the way. I still think they have a ways to go on route planning as well as when you get to a charger, there's no, um, no plug in charge. Of course, to use battery preconditioning, which you need to in the winter, you need to physically select a charger in here. This will give you a preconditioning icon and then the battery will be warming. I don't know the limitations on Ionic 6. I imagine it's the same as Ionic 5, where when you get below 20% state of charge, it will no longer be preconditioning the battery, which is just a bit, little bit too cautious in my opinion. So there's still some work that needs to be done on the fine tuning here. And um, yeah, well, I think that's kind of the tour of this thing. I really like this stitching color right here on the seats. I like the way everything feels. It's very Hyundai feeling. This is really the only major downside. These feel really cheap in my opinion. I'm not loving this and I'm not really sure why they had to move all the switches away from the door and then leave this plastic bit. That, that's probably my biggest annoyance with it. But uh, really you can just tell the quality of the car is very high. This must be where the digital mirrors must show um, where you don't have the physical ones in certain markets, that's gotta be the digital mirror area, which doesn't exist. There's a ton of ambient lighting in this car as well. That was a big thing they wanted to talk about was dual color ambient lighting. You can really create your own scapes. I'm looking forward to seeing that at night. I don't know if we'll have the opportunity or not, but that would be kind of cool. And uh, yeah, let me give you my final thoughts. So there you go, my sort of initial thoughts on the Ionic 6. I can't wait to tell you how it drives, but I think let's evaluate this car first in a vacuum and then bring in my impressions after spending a lot of time in Tesla Model 3 as this car's main competitor and also Polestar 2 to an extent. I think this is certainly a little bit different than Polestar 2 and much nicer in many ways uh, and, and actually would be my choice, my clear choice over Polestar 2 just because of the charging speeds, the, the uh, you know, the way that everything is put together. This feels like a more solid electric package to me at least. But let's talk uh, about this in a vacuum. Body, build quality, interior build quality, materials, second to none this thing lines up perfect it feels great they have you know the koreans are killing it when it comes to building a solid product and it's no different here from a technical standpoint the battery pack is a little bit small but maybe the car is very efficient um, that's at least what all the numbers are suggesting at this point we'll have to do our own testing but uh, it seems like that small battery isn't as much of a limitation in this as it is in ionic 5. The fast charging on this battery pack is unbelievable. The thermal management systems are unbelievable. Now that it can do battery preconditioning, it's not perfect, but it can do it. It's all really good from a technical standpoint and probably class leading in terms of what, um, you know, sort of power levels you're able to flow in and out of this vehicle. Also, how could I forget vehicle to load? The limited option has the charge port, the you know 120 volt outlet right down there in the center. The other models, you can just buy the adapter and pull it out of the charge port. That's pretty cool. So I love these little functions that you get in this car. And then the styling and pricing. Well, styling is subjective. I think the front of it looks cool. It's funky, it's different. I, I want to embrace different cars on the road. Um, I'm just not loving what's going on in the back end. Some people do, maybe it'll grow on me. Certain angles, I'm like, damn, that looks awesome. And certain angles, I'm like, oh my God, this is not it. So it's still maybe something that needs to grow on me, but I think I'm glad they took the plunge. I'm glad it looks like this. It's definitely a conversation piece and it's not bad. It's just like a little bit weird. Uh, you know, when you like go to a different country and you got to try their food and you're like, oh, I'm not going to try that. And then you actually do and you're like, oh, it's not actually that bad. Um, I don't know. It's got to grow on me. And the pricing is really good, actually. 41000 on the base car, 56 fully maxed out. That's reasonable if you got the $7,500 tax credit, which you don't unless you lease it. 
Uh, so I'm really curious to see how the leasing numbers are on these. I think Hyundai is getting it all wrong again by bringing way too many mid-spec models in. They said that's going to be the volume model. I think Ionic 5 showed everyone wanted a limited. Uh, and there were not nearly enough base cars either. So I hope the product spread, at least the ones that they import into our market, is going to be a little bit better suited. I think it's a bit of a shame that they were kind of alluding to the fact that the small battery um, really isn't going to be high volume. You're not going to see many of them. And to me, that's a little bit of a... A little bit of a misleading number, right? Because you, you say the car starts at 41,000, but if no one can buy it and it doesn't come out for another couple months, then I don't know. Actually, you know what just happened here? It just added in the route planning. So it took that entire time, you know, minutes on end, and it's just mapped out a route to here. I don't know how it's gonna expect to cross this gap and get up to Colorado, but it's still thinking. It definitely is. It says AC charging port. <laughs> okay, maybe don't listen to this. If you're gonna take one of these on a road trip, use a better route planner, check plug share, use rate your charge when our app comes out because this is not a, not good route planning. So don't, don't trust any reviews that says this thing has good route planning because it's gonna make you sit in an AC charger for 10 hours to charge up. That's dumb. So, um, you know, now I guess let's, let's sort of evaluate this in context of Model 3. Well, in terms of ease of ownership, in terms of cost, especially right now, the Model 3 still gets the $7,500 tax credit. It's sort of a no-brainer to just go Tesla. There are reasons people don't want to drive a Tesla. This certainly feels way nicer on the inside. This is a much more premium product than the Tesla, no question. But the cost, the efficiency of the Model 3 is known to be really good. The big glass roof, the app, everything about that Tesla just rocks. I made a whole video about it and it's really hard for a car to compete with it. There are certain categories that this thing does better in ter in terms of charging performance, in terms of, you know, fit and finish, in terms of materials, maybe styling for some, certainly more range if you spec it up. But um, when you're starting to look at the low end of the market, well, just go Tesla, no question. When you start specking up to the nicer ones when we're talking 50 something thousand dollars, the Tesla, you're in Model 3 performance category, which is gonna be way faster than this. This is gonna be more of a everyday comfortable cruiser with all of the tech that you're seeing and nice materials. So then it actually might make sense for you to switch into the Ionic. But of course, I like every review, I also have to mention the Tesla supercharger network is second to none. With this car, you're still relying on the crappy public charging networks to put it nicely. And, um, you know, it's just going to be a pain in the butt for many of your road trips. It's not nearly going to be as easy as the Tesla charging experience. And that's just an, an unfortunate fact of life in 2023. Hopefully that will change over time. But right now it's still early adopter days for electric vehicle road tripping. If you charge at home and you never take a road trip, your experience will be unchanged. But I always have to throw that in there. So there you go. I hope this uh, helps you learn more about the Ionic 6, my initial impressions, my first tour of it, if you will. I know it's a long video. We're just trying it out, touching things, feeling things, opening up panels. And um, I'm really, really liking the Ionic 6. No question. I knew I would because I love the Ionic 5. For me, I'm still an Ionic 5 guy all day long. Love the hatch, love the styling. That's the move. But if you want more range or you just like sedans, Ionic 6, you're not really giving up anything. It's pretty sweet. So thanks so much for watching another Out of Spec Reviews video, a full tour of this thing. We'll see you on another one soon. Bye-bye.